Trey, there are so many moving parts to this case. So many alleged crimes that have surrounded this family that have been linked, frankly, to a significant chain of mysterious deaths and serious allegations. And it's all culminating right now in this one sensational trial. How would you have prosecuted this case? Oh, gosh, Emily, I, I would have I would have done opening a little bit differently. Uh, opening to me is about establishing credibility, reliability, trustworthiness with the jury. Um, I probably would have I mean, going chronologically with both your opening and your and, and your uh, direct your case in chief is fine. It's a conservative, natural way to do it. I would have probably started with Paul and Maggie's day. Um, I wouldn't have started at the murder scene. I would have said, okay, I mean, because you think about it, Emily, what scares people the most? I mean, you and I are sitting here talking today, and it's it has not entered either one of our minds that today will be the last day of our lives. It just has not entered our minds. We We haven't even thought about that. So if you want to move the jury, I would have them wake up like Maggie and Paul Murdoch, having no idea that this was going to be the last day of their lives. And what series of decisions or what led them to be where they were when the final shot, when the fatal shots were fired. So, look, trials are won months and months before you ever, like, open your mouth in court. Um, these prosecutors are, um, and I know some of them very, very well. I know Don Zelenka very, very well. He's been at the table. Um, he's a brilliant appellate lawyer. And I would tell him if he was on the podcast with us, he's a brilliant appellate lawyer. It's a different skill set to connect with a jury. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how much jury trial experience the prosecutors have. Harpootlian and Jim Griffin have a ton. I don't know about the prosecutors. So it, it's it's really, can you put the jury where you want the jury to be? And I would have wanted them to wake up the last day of Maggie and Paul Murdoch's lives, having no idea this was going to be the last day of their lives. Verdicts have hinged on juror fatigue. They have hinged on jurors not understanding confusion, being inundated with data. They have hinged on the fact that prosecution has lost the storytelling nature, to your point. It's crucial that they connect with the jury. That's all the jury has, because at the end of the day, it's just like you and I talking. My takeaways are my takeaways. And the stronger the connection, the more persuasive you are. In this criticism of how the prosecution has strategized, though, their approach, what might be the reasons why they've taken this direction? What positives, if any, do you see about the route that they've taken? Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, if you want a lesson in futility and frustration, then call mm -hmm. a jury after a verdict and ask them what they base their verdict on. Mm -hmm. You will pull your hair out because it's not what we as lawyers would have thought was most important. I mean, it's so bad, Emily. I mean, when you're starting off, you want the jury to kind of tell you what you did right, what you need to work on. And then you do that four or five times and you say, I need to go see a psychiatrist because this makes no sense at all. And you stop asking the jury. So here's what you have going for you if you're a prosecutor. You have two bodies. There's no question they're dead. Sometimes you don't have a body. So it wasn't self-defense. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't suicide. So I know it sounds simplistic, but to the jury, we have a murder. The question is now, who did it? I mean, we get all caught up in the why, but it's really who did it. The why is superfluous. You don't ever have to prove it. I mean, they want to know. You better give them some explanation, but who? So you begin to eliminate who, who had access to them, who had... Um, familiarity with the scene, and you begin to narrow it down, and then you have this gift, this gift which I would rather have, Emily, than a confession, a false exculpatory statement. Mm -hmm. You have someone lying about being present, and I read all these articles about, you know, what a brilliant strategic move to admit that he was lying. Well, what choice did he have? I mean, the jury knew he was lying. So then you have selective 
paranoia brought about by drug abuse. And it is selective because he remembers lots of things and he was truthful about lots of things. It's just the most important thing, which is where were you when your wife and son had their heads blown off that he struggles with it? I mean, I, I, I watched some of the testimony. The level of detail about which bird dog was chasing which chicken. You can remember that. And you're struggling to recall whether or not you fell asleep at about the time you claim some opioid drug sellers blew your wife and son's head off. I just, juries do not think like lawyers, which is why no one would ever seat me and you on a jury. <laughs> they think you, but they wouldn't see me. They think they see me. we have two bodies. Someone did it. It's not suicide. It's not accident. It's not self-defense. Who did it? And then I'm sure they're in there thinking, okay, even if the prosecution did not, did not fully carry the burden beyond a reasonable doubt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do we really think, is this like OJ where we're going to go find the real killer? I mean, do they really think the real killer is, quote, out there somewhere? I don't, I don't think they do. Well, and that's why that, as you called it, the, quote, simplistic approach, that's why it matters because you can't build that impenetrable storytelling without building it brick by brick. Because if the defense, if all they have to do is poke a hole enough, a wide enough hole, that it removes that doubt or it inserts that doubt, then all is lost. So you have to build it brick by brick and you have to say, this is what happened and take everyone through step by step by step, illuminating all the inconsistencies. Now you talked about how some say, oh, it's amazing. It was brilliant strategy. I agree with you. He was caught between a rock and a hard place and he had to admit it. Now, part of the question is why he's even in the stand to begin with. Some people calling that brilliant. Some people call that uh, an absolute hallmark of hubris. What say you? Uh, I call it having a lawyer for a client and you cannot control your client. Uh, I I'll bet you Harpootlian and Griffin are telling him don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. They probably mm -hmm. think they're in a decent spot in terms of arguing doubt. So what Murdoch is thinking is, okay, I have a chance to walk. I mean, a hung jury just means I get retried again, maybe with, you know, a better prosecutorial strategy. I mean, retrials to me benefit the prosecutor. So you get a hung mm -hmm. jury, you go through this again, and they've got a better chance of convicting me. So this is my shot to walk, to get an acquittal. It's also the hubris of thinking I'm good enough to explain anything away. And mm -hmm. candidly, Emily, the prosecutor gave him way too much time to talk, way too much time on cross. He had no control over the narrative. I mean, I, who really am suspicious of everyone, I'm sitting there watching him thinking, yeah, he's doing a good job testifying. I mean, yeah. the prosecutor was like using him as an expert to explain certain things. And all the while, he's building a rapport with the jury. The, you've got to control cross-examination. And Creighton lost control. I'll give you an example. Whether or not the Murdoch family is prominent, first of all, how do you even define that? And secondly, what difference does that make? What difference does it make whether the Murdochs were prominent or not prominent as to whether or not Maggie and Paul had their heads blown off. And they, they waste all this time by splitting atoms over well, who gets to define what's prominent. I'll give you one other example, and then we'll be quiet because it's your podcast and not mine. But you can tell that I get animated about this. You saw the badge hanging from his pocket. They spent a lot of time talking about solicitor. I was a solicitor. I had a badge. I didn't put it in the console where the cops could see me when they stopped me for speeding, but I did have one. He had it on. Why would you not save that for closing argument? Mm. That's a pretty decent piece of evidence. The fact that you call him Paul during the sled interviews, but now all of a sudden he's Paul Paul. Why not use that in closing where no one has a chance to, to, re, to rebut it? There is no explanation. You leave that with the jury. He gave him a chance to explain both of them. So what if that's dovetails in when you talk about the prominence, 
and whether it matters. You talk about, you know, his use of nicknames to sort of engender himself, ingratiate himself with the jury. What if that all goes into the lack of accountability that this family has had, has enjoyed for decades? And then that goes into the plausibility of him thinking he could get away with it. That while it not be at its heart the motive, if the motive, let's say, was these the financial mess that he was in, coupled with his opioid addiction and the, the massive lawsuits that he was facing, the lies over his financials for so long. But it's the fact that he thought he could get away with it. Because at the end of the day, for most people that aren't true sociopaths or psychopaths, the reason they don't do something is because of deterrence. Here, it seems he thinks he could get away with it for the sake of this conversation, if he's the one. So maybe all of that gets wrapped up into why he could blow off the heads of his wife and his son, hire a hitman to kill him, engage in so much nefarious and consistent, complex lying through the years because he knew full well he could get away with it. Well, I think you're right. But if you and I were prosecuting this case together, I think I would say, look, Emily, you're the lead prosecutor and I'm second chairing you. However, why don't we boil that down to something tangible, which is the ability to impact crime scenes? So we know he tried to impact the investigation and the crime scene surrounding the boat accident. We've heard references to his son and a girlfriend getting into a car wreck, and he was called to come remove the alcohol. I mean, this is stuff, no matter how prominent you are as a family. I mean, I would I would use the word prominent as a synonym for entitled. Mm-hmm. So you're entitled. You think that you can get away with things the rest of us cannot get away with. So, of course, he's going to impact the crime scene he was doing it when it was just going to save him money in a civil suit. So, of course, he's going to do it if it means saving his life. And then I think you begin to paint for the jury a difference between famous, prominent, and entitled. And I think that also includes the perceived shame. Because I think with entitlement um, and with that level of entrenched history of prominence, there comes with it an absolute aversion to shame. And so a family like that, worse than financial, you know, dues is, is a mark on that name. Worse than that is, is, is being that family member that erases the good name of the three before you and the portraits in the courthouse and the, the reputation around town that you are the ink stain in that genealogy that has imprinted itself so deeply there in that county. And that shame might be just as big of a motive or, or, or to um, somehow avoid that. That's why he was the role of fixer. Well, I served with his father. His father was the solicitor when I was the solicitor. So I saw him twice a year. Um, I'm not sure um, that people didn't already know that that family um, got away with stuff that the rest of us mm -hmm. could not get away with. Uh, now, when you have the power, um, it doesn't really matter what other people think about you. I, I would, I, I would offer this potentially um, that that Murdoch is such a good liar, and you have to be a good liar. And 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 I don't like say that as a as a compliment or an insult. I mean, to be told that you're a good liar is probably not a compliment. But he is a good liar. But you have to be if you're an opioid addict and you're stealing money from your law partners. So good liars can convince themselves, particularly if you have sociopathic um, ideations, that it was not me that did it. You remember when he used the word intentionally? I would never intentionally. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, what I read in that and what I would argue to the jury, and again, you don't do it in cross. Because he's never going to agree with you. You do it when there is no rebuttal. Intentionally is a euphemism for the drugs did it. If the drugs made me forget where I was and lie to you, then why would those same drugs not be responsible if I did commit an act of violence? It wasn't me. And you convince yourself that that's not the real me. I would never have done that. I think the family um, probably rationalizes the way other people do, that it's okay for us to do this because we're serving a larger good.
Mm. And that's a dangerous path to go down, but lots of people do. And I can't imagine what it's like to be part of a genealogy like that, where perhaps from the second you even knew who you were, that that was baked into your being, that there's always been that protection of the name, protection of self, the manipulation. Maybe it's not lying. Maybe it's just manipulation. It's whatever it is to get out unscathed and to protect what you have inherited in that moment, what you've never known anything different. And we see it, too, in, in inconsistencies and in pivots in his testimony and in his, his defenses, even saying, oh, I, I, my number one thing, I distrust law enforcement. That's a pretty big statement coming from someone who represented the state, whose family represented the state, who's incarcerated hundreds, if not thousands of people currently in that state. What do you make of that, Trey? I was stunned that he said that. I almost thought yeah. that he would go back and try to clean it up, that he mm -hmm. was distrustful of SLED. So if you and I are prosecuting the case, we draw a link between the fact that he distrusts law enforcement when he is on the hot seat. And yet he's got a badge with him at all time because he wants everyone else to, to respect what that represents, that that's somehow a pathway for him. I mean, there's no other reason to have the badge hanging from your hip pocket than you think that that is supposed to denote or connote something. I would have probably spent more time asking him which um, which cops in his in his own office, which investigators in his solicitor's office he doesn't trust. Mm. I'd make him it, name names. It also flies in the face of his own behavior that night. Um, and again, going back to I guess this this self notion of being a fixer and also just saving his own hide. Um, remember saying changing his story, how much he tried to move the body. Well, your your white shirt is pristine. Oh, then it changes to, I just put my fingers on my son's neck. There was a lot of, you would see at that time, trust of law enforcement, right? That's who exactly he immediately, oh, you, you boys know me, right? Everything's fine. So what a different story to then say, well, it was born out of distrust in that moment, right? That's a big inconsistency. But you put your finger on it. So why does he have to say that? Why does he have to say that? Because of how damning that interview was, where he lied about where he was at the most important point. So, okay, I'm going to blame the drugs, but for the 12 out of 12 people that don't believe in selective paranoia due to drug use, I'm going to have to come up with something else. I don't know the complexion of this jury. I don't know men versus women. I don't know the racial breakdown, but... He's trying to plant the seed because of what happened in Memphis and, and other places that maybe you shouldn't trust law enforcement mm. either. It's tough when you're in law enforcement carrying a badge, having parties for cops. But look, he's not, he, you say a rock and a hard place. I mean, it is rare to have that big of a lie on full display. And just like you kind of over talk on these innocuous points, the amount of time he spent on these meaningless, innocuous points, you also sometimes tend to overprove things. Mm -hmm. Look, the fact that you're paranoid doesn't mean you didn't do something wrong. You can both be paranoid and have done something wrong. I think it is that voice in him that he's convinced himself it was the drugs and not him. Okay, that's fine. But he knows legally that's no distinction. So he tries to kind of overprove or overexplain that seminal lie that I think is going to wind up doing him, doing him in. And remember, for listeners, that the prosecution is not seeking the death penalty here. They're seeking life without parole. So he might be in his head thinking, well, this is going to be a way that will affect sentencing. Right. And we've seen that in the past as well, but usually in the context of capital punishment, where juries decline to go that final and fatal step because they say, all right, there was some there's some mental element that prevents us from fully hinging this on your complete, rational, acute mental state at that time. There's postpartum depression. There's drug use. There is something that makes us hesitate to say, yes, it was cold and calculated and you knew exactly what you were doing. But the charges here don't reflect there, it's not manslaughter. It's not some type of passionate or lack of control situation. The charges reflect that this was calculated, as we've been discussing, given this financial motive. So 
him leaning so heavily potentially on his drug use or drug abuse, um, if, if there's a if there's a compassionate cell in, the, in that jury base, then that might that might affect sentencing. But to your point, I don't see it succeeding anywhere else. No, and I'll tell you what Cliff Newman's going to charge to the jury whenever it happens. Voluntary intoxication is no defense. Mm. So the fact that you're a drug addict, only if someone involuntarily made you take the drugs, that that is no defense to any crime. You are correct. In a capital case, it would be diminished mental capacity. It would be something else that would be a mitigating factor that would uh, cause the jury to go with life. But Cliff, if he's convicted, Judge Newman... It's mandatory minimum 30 years in South Carolina, and 30 means 30, day for day, and the maximum's life. So you have someone who's killed two family members. There's no chance in the world that Cliff Newman does not sentence him to life for both of them if he is convicted. Here's the other part of it. Of course, you can never, Emily, meet desperate people They do all this rationalizing that you and I wouldn't do. Oh, we just don't think like that. Let's assume he walks out of the courtroom Thursday or Friday. Let's assume he's acquitted. He's walking right straight into federal custody where he's going to be tried for a series of serious financial crimes that based on the the amount of loss, the dollar amount, he's going to be in jail for a long time no matter what. So maybe it's he wants to go to jail, but not having killed the two people. I mean, what parents kill their children? Mm-hmm. That's the first thing I told my daughter when this crime happened. Mm-hmm. I got to give her credit. She told me he did it. And I said, honey, parents do not kill their children. Mm-hmm. We just can't think about that. And yet it looks like he did. I would just qualify that statement that, you know, Rational parents don't. Yes. Loving parents don't. Non-sociopath parents don't. Um, And I think, you know, when you're redlining, when you are, when you're, when you are in the thick of that combat, which he is, he's, he's in that thick assault type situation where every day is just about, to your point, protecting his skin, fixing the situation so it's one step at a time. He's probably not thinking that far ahead to the financial crimes anywhere. Or if he does, it's just a remote possibility, given what we've talked about, his lack of accountability, his hubris, the thought that he can get away with it, the thought that he's going to walk free. And then, you know what, I'm going to get out of those financial crimes too. My specific intent was eroded given my addiction. All the blame is placed on that. You know, he he's the kind of defendant that would sue the drug pusher. He's the kind of defendant that would say, you know what, I'm actually going to sue you and blame you for this. I think we haven't seen the last of the surprising or sort of not surprising elements here in this case. Um, Let's focus just for a moment, X's and O's, on SLED. If you could explain for listeners what that is, how it's different in South Carolina versus other states. Yeah, well, we have 46 counties, and each county has a sheriff, and we have different police officers. But we have a statewide law enforcement division. It's called SLED. SLED is an abbreviation for the South Carolina Law Enforcement or state law enforcement division. And SLED is called in uh, when there are uh, really, really messy crime scenes. Uh, They have really good forensic capabilities in terms of DNA and blood spatter and all the things that you would not expect every county to have. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a county that that is a big county. So they have their own forensic units, but we still call in SLED from time to time. This one was a little interesting because Murdoch worked as a volunteer for the solicitor's office down there. Duffy Stone is the first non-Murdoch solicitor in this part of the state. Mm-hmm. And, and and Duffy allowed Alex Murdoch to be a, a volunteer solicitor. You also, this was Collington County, right, where this happened and not Hampton County. They're all small counties down there other than Buford. When you think Hilton Head, think Buford. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The rest of them are are small counties, so they probably don't have robust uh, crime scene analysts. So you're going to bring in the folks from Columbia, um, probably ordinarily, even if it were not a high profile defendant, you they probably still would have brought in sled, just given the crime scene and what the cops found the night they got there. And tell us about how the crime scene was altered 
damaged, impacted? And what do you make of the competence level of what of what occurred that night? Yeah, I mean it's hard. I I I I, I want to like be respectful of the police. I mean, obviously in hindsight, you rope it off. Nobody comes in. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you you. But is this a homicide scene? Is it a suicide homicide scene? You. You, you've got a lawyer that you know because he works for the DA's office, for the solicitor's office. And in a perfect world, you make everybody mad. You tape it off and say no one's coming in, nobody's doing anything. You put up tents so the rain doesn't impact it. That's a perfect world. The question then becomes, and, and you know, Emily, I mean, trials are, <laughs> they're, trials are really two trials. It's what the cops did and then what some defense attorney thinks they should have done. Mm -hmm. And and that's what the cross is all about during, during all the cops. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do I think juries have a sense of the difference between hindsight being 2020 and what was really, really incompetent and malfeasance on the front end. I had a case one time where a woman was beaten with the buckle of a belt. Mm -hmm. It was a domestic violence case. She wasn't killed, but she was severely injured. The police officer did not even retrieve the belt. Okay? That is inexcusable. There is no excuse a prosecutor can stand in front of a jury and say, well, this is why he didn't get the assault weapon. There are things here where I think a jury would say, we wish you had done it, but it wasn't intentional. It wasn't, it wasn't sheer incompetence. It was just a wrong judgment call. Um, that's that's how I think a jury will take it. I, I didn't hear anything that kind of spoke to me as just utter incompetence. How could you not have known that? And it didn't rise. No decision that night on the part of law enforcement rose to the level of having a negative long term impact is what I'm hearing on the strength of the prosecution's case and on the protection of evidence um, in a in a catastrophic way for the state. All right, so you and I were going to list the most damning pieces of evidence against Alex Murdoch. I mean, obviously, we start with the fact that they're two dead people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the failure to pursue to preserve the crime scene. I mean, if their argument was this, what if the defense argument was this was a murder suicide? But that's not their. I mean, that that's not what they're arguing. So it's definitely a double homicide. The question is who did it. So tire marks footprints. So, but what's the best if you and I are the prosecutors, you have a false exculpatory statement about where he was, and then you have the technology. Mm -hmm. And he claims he's not a big fan of technology, although I noticed he used it in his own defense to say he was too tall to have, to have shot the weapon, because God knows none of us can bend down. So uh, he used technology there. But you've got him via cell phone and navigation device, you got him there and you got him moving quickly and you got him moving quickly about the time that we think your wife and son were killed. And then we got you getting in your car and we got you speeding a little bit, except when you pause, which is about where we found your wife's cell phone. So that technology was not impacted at all by the failure, perhaps, to properly maintain a crime scene. What do you make of the use of two different weapons there? If if what the prosecution is alleging to be true, why the use of two weapons? Why the use of a shotgun and a rifle? Well, do you remember when Alex Murdoch wanted someone to shoot him, but it to so it's really a suicide, but I need to claim the insurance proceeds for my one surviving son, same reason. I need people to believe there were two shooters. What better way to provide evidence to a jury that there were two shooters than to use two guns? That's that's uh, from day one. That's why I've thought. I mean, when we hear two guns, we think two shooters. I do. I think of the waste of time and the the more complexity you engage in, the harder it is to explain it away. That's the more malice. Actually, True. to me, it's the more malice. True. It was not me having a single gun and losing control due to a heat of passion. You mentioned manslaughter. It's definitely not manslaughter in South mm -hmm. Carolina. But 
But manslaughter is a sudden heat of passion killing. Mm -hmm. One firearm, two people enrage me, you know, shot, shot. This is more malice. I've got to go pick up another weapon. I've got to orient myself to that weapon, aim that weapon. I think he did it because he's trying to construct, as he's done, a crime scene that doesn't reflect what really happened. He did it with the boat case. Remember, their position is somebody else was driving the boat. And it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter that that kid is going to be saddled with a conviction, perhaps, or a civil judgment for something he didn't do. They've reconciled it's better that this innocent person be convicted because our family's importance surpasses all of that. It's more important that my son get insurance proceeds, even though this is really a suicide. And it's more important that you think that two shooters were involved than for you to know that a single husband and father just use separate weapons. That's right, because everyone else is discardable. That's the whole bottom line when you have that 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 hubris we're talking about, that unfallibility, that absolute um, lack of of human quality, that your name is more important than the human quality. Your name, preserving that name is more important than any type of truth. Then everyone else becomes discardable. And that's exactly what I was saying, that he 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 created a, a more complicated procedure for himself, which represents more cunning, more cruelty, more psychopathy, more determination to carry out this atrocious plan. And, you know, it, we were talking earlier about, you know, no parent murders their child that isn't um, sociopathic, psychopathic, or evil, and and insert all of those words. But South Carolina also, you guys had the Susan Smith case. And that's an example, not only, so this was a a mother that killed her two children. She blamed it on postpartum depression um, in others. But she led the media on a wild goose chase beforehand. And that is an example where the jury declined to levy capital punishment um, and and I terribly, ironically, insert whatever word you want there. She's eligible for parole actually this year, but that uh, was that same state. So that's been, um, you know, it's it's another example of the impact, the persuasion that juries can fall under, and also the complexities when dealing with um, femicide. Uh, That is a case that, unfortunately, I am uh, all too familiar with. I was at the United States Attorney's Office when they were investigating it as a potential carjacking because that's what she said it was. Mm -hmm. Driving back from a University of South Carolina football game because the cops wanted to pull some phone records and they needed a prosecutor to go to uh, uh, the wire request or the the subpoena. Uh, But I'll say this, uh, the cops never thought it was a carjacking. The cops never, she blamed it on a, on an African-American man who carjacked and kidnapped her children. Um, she is eligible for parole, although I will say this. She admitted that she did it, and she blamed being sexually abused by family members. And she had a really good lawyer in David Bruck, and he was able to convince the jury that, um, of course, you can't tell the jury life doesn't mean life. Mm-hmm. For all the people that are into truth and sentencing and, and like transparency and whatever other little words they use, they never told the jury life doesn't mean life. Or she may have gotten death. She's parole eligible in 30 years. She ain't going to get it. But um, her husband, uh, up until about a week ago, I saw him every Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. So you talk about the the mark of grief on a parent's face. That, that law. Now, He remarried. He had other children. He's a wonderful guy. He's a great guy. Uh, Saw him every Saturday morning at the grocery store, but he still has the mark, the agonizing marks of grief of having lost two children. She admitted it, and she asked a jury to give her life, and they thought life meant life. Alex Murdoch ain't admitting anything. He says, you got the wrong guy. We are looking forward to having you be the guests for that case, which is going to be in um, likely the next 10 or 15 episodes straight. If you're free, we'd love to have you because your insight is unequivocal. And that is such a gripping case for so many different reasons, legally and emotionally. 
Um, and certainly that community, in addition to that father, most importantly, that father, uh, the grief is permanent. Anything you want to leave us with as we go into the final days of this historical trial for so many reasons? South Carolina is weird. Um, usually the party with the burden of proof gets last argument no matter what. Usually. In South Carolina, prosecution doesn't get last argument unless the defense puts up a defense. And they have here. So he who goes or she who goes last has the best opportunity. And it's going to be really important that the prosecutors don't go with what they think the best pieces of evidence are. They've been in the room for a month with this jury. If you're not reading what resonated with this jury and what resonated with that, then you're not doing your job. So it is your job to convince them that innocent people do not lie about the seminal moment in this chronology. And he did. You're never going to convince people that financial crimes lead people to blow their wives and sons' heads off. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not going to convince them of that. That's why I don't get caught up in motive, Emily, because, I mean, if you and I could sit here for the rest of our lives and I'd say, okay, come up with a motive that helps you understand killing your wife and son. I mean, you would never, like, come up with something, okay, well, that explains it. I get it now. <laughs> I understand robbing because I need money. I understand somebody made me mad, so I shot him. It's wrong, but I understand it. What could help you understand blowing your wife and son's heads off? So why the prosecution is spending so much time explaining a why that cannot be explained? It's the who. And he lied about where he was. Innocent people don't do that. And then you got the technology that confirms uh Closing argument's important. We'll see, we'll see how good the prosecutors are at moving this jury. Um, I have to be a little better than what I saw in opening and cross. Mm. Trey Gowdy, no one has insight like you. We're so grateful. Thank you so much for everything today. All of your insight, all of your analysis, um, all of your candor. And funny, not funny, but you mentioned in the beginning how, you know, no one... No one walks outside thinking this is their last day. No one, no one walks outside thinking this is the day they're going to get murdered. But I have to admit, every time I walk outside of my apartment door, I do a sweep and think to myself, is this how it's going to be when the doorman walks in and I make sure my bed is made and I make sure everything is clean? <laughs> it might be the morbid seed in me. It might be the reason I'm hosting this true crime podcast. But believe me, that thought crosses my mind every morning. <laughs> and, and, and it's, you know, I mean, it, it's, I don't want to say it's a curse. But when you're a lawyer and when you've seen what terrible people can do, it is impossible to wash that off. You can't. I wish I could go through life like my wife. My wife doesn't even lock the door. She can't imagine doing something to someone. Cannot imagine it. And for you and I, when you've seen it your whole life, you do think about it. But, but the, the finality of death. And, and I'll bet you Maggie Murdoch and Paul Murdoch did not wake up thinking today is going to be the day mm -hmm. that my husband slash father blows my head off. And if you can get the jury thinking like that and less of him as this folksy guy talking about a bird dog chasing a chicken, then I think you got a pretty good shot at a conviction.